You are about to take a flight through and around Lake Tahoe, viewing the landscape as Earth scientists. Lake Tahoe is affected by many impacts, including urbanization, loss of clarity, invasive species, and climate change. This tour provides the underlying geologic history of the basin for a better understanding of these issues. Immediately east of the Sierra Nevada, arrows indicate a zone of shearing where California is tearing away from Nevada. The Lake Tahoe Basin is being pulled apart by this extension of the Earth's crust. The Tahoe landscape was formed and continues to be formed by powerful tectonic forces. Lake Tahoe is ringed by mountains that form a bowl-like basin or watershed. Snow and rain captured within the watershed eventually flow into the lake via 63 streams. The land portion of the watershed is only a little bigger than the lake itself, and that is one of the reasons Lake Tahoe is naturally and spectacularly clear. The three-dimensional computer image is made from measurements of the land elevation, the lake basin depth, and satellite images. The vertical scale is exaggerated so that features can be seen more easily. The landscape has been formed by three major faults. Hundreds of earthquakes have shaped the basin over the last two million years. Erosion and glaciation add finishing touches, often concealing the faults. The West Tahoe Fault is the longest of the three. Over the last 40,000 years, the east side of the fault has dropped up to 100 feet, the height of a 10-story building. The last major earthquake on this fault, a magnitude 7, took place 4,000 years ago. Geologists say this fault is due for another earthquake. The Truckee River near Tahoe City is the only outflow from Lake Tahoe. This dam at the outlet was completed in 1913 to hold back an extra six feet of water for use downstream. In drought years, the lake level falls lower than the natural rim and no water flows into the Truckee River from Lake Tahoe until rain and snowmelt refill the lake above the rim. Researchers work out of our UC Davis field station located in Tahoe City. Because of the clarity of the water and the extent of the Tahoe City shelf, these researchers must travel several miles aboard the research vessel John LeConte to take Secchi depth readings in the deeper water. Secchi measurements demonstrate a loss of lake clarity over time. We are now looking to the northwest, where volcanic mountains closed off the original valley. The enclosed basin has contained a lake for the last two million years. The steep underwater cliff along State Line Point marks the State Line Fault. The underwater cliff face descends to the deepest part of the lake, 1,644 feet deep. Imagine swimming over this edge and looking down into darkness. The Incline Village Fault extends from the land to the depths of the lake. Scientists use sound waves to measure sediment layers. The east side of the fault, on the right, has slipped downward. The last big earthquake here was about 500 years ago. The Tahoe Center for Environmental Sciences is less than two miles from the fault. The east side of the lake receives half the amount of precipitation that falls upon the west side, due to the rain shadow effect. The Carson Range east of the lake is almost entirely granitic rock. The clarity of Lake Tahoe owes a great deal to the amount of granitic rock that surrounds it, because weathered granite is low in the nutrients and fine particles that reduce water clarity. Moving along the East Shore and Carson Range, we can see the Flume Trail. Today, mountain bikers enjoy this spectacular trail, originally cut into the granite to carry water from Marlette Lake to Virginia City. In the 19th century, most of the trees in the Tahoe Basin were cut down and transported to the silver mines around Virginia City. The mines of the Comstock era were called the Tomb of the Sierra Forest. Accelerated erosion on barren slopes reduced Tahoe's famous clarity. Fortunately, the second growth forest helped slow the erosion and Lake Clarity was naturally restored. The natural caves in Cave Rock were cut by wave action about 60,000 years ago when the lake level was much higher. Similar caves can be found in Eagle Rock on the west side of the lake. Wave action also cuts terraces into the offshore sediment. Ancient terraces benchmark the changes in elevation due to movement along the faults. K-1 
Caves and terraces on the west side are higher relative to caves and terraces of the same age on the east side. This confirms the long-term trends of fault movement in the basin. The bays along the southeast corner of the lake have been invaded by Asian clams. Non-native Asian clams were first spotted in Lake Tahoe in 2002. Since then, the populations have increased immensely. The abundant clams concentrate nutrients that stimulate algal blooms. These clams are changing the underwater landscape. Researchers are working together with basin managers on experiments to control clam populations. The watersheds of the South Shore are the largest and the most urbanized in the basin. Building road and airport construction and modification of the natural stream channels have significantly altered this region. Stormwater that flows from asphalt parking lots and roads carries dirty water into the lake. Urbanized land makes up only 11% of the basin, but contributes nearly three quarters of the fine particle pollution. About a third of the inflow to the lake and most of the urban runoff comes from the upper Truckee River watershed. All landowners in the basin are required to minimize the amount of sediment and fine particles that flow from their property by following best management practices or BMPs. Stream and wetland restoration also help to reduce the amount of sediment and nutrients reaching the lake. While the upper Truckee River will never be returned to its pre-development condition, ongoing restoration efforts will significantly improve how the watershed functions. The area that is now the Tahoe Keys used to be a natural marsh. This wetland area was once one of the largest in the Sierra Nevada. Imagine what the marsh of the old Upper Truckee River looked like before development. A wetland is an amazingly effective water filter, settling the sediment and absorbing the nutrients. That filtration capacity is lost every time we lose a wetland. Restoration efforts in small constructed wetlands attempt to restore what was lost. All remaining wetlands in the basin are now protected from development. The shallow channels of the Tahoe Keys also provide fertile habitat for invasive species to gain a foothold. Invasive aquatic plants provide shelter for non-native warm water fishes. Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed, largemouth bass and bluegill, none of these are native to Lake Tahoe, but they have made the Tahoe Keys their home and have migrated from there to other parts of the lake. Warming from climate change could accelerate this colonization. A large fire raged in the Angora Ridge area in 2007, burning over 250 homes in the runaway blaze. Wildfire is a concern in the Tahoe Basin because after the Comstock era logging, the second growth forest regrew thickly under a management policy of fire suppression. Forest thinning and defensible space keep the forest healthy and protect life and property. Angora Ridge was formed by glaciers. Glaciers are massive, slow-moving rivers of ice gouging out U-shaped valleys. They pick up rocks in their path and carry them down slope, piling them into ridges called moraines. After glaciers retreat, the moraines are left behind. The size of the Angora Ridge moraine indicates the height of the glaciers that formed it. There have been at least three major ice episodes in the last 120,000 years when temperatures remained cold enough for the snowpack to last through the summers. Ice blanketed the mountains for tens of thousands of years, shaping the land with glacial features. In the southwest corner of the basin, Fallen Leaf Lake sits within a glacially carved canyon. Dead trees standing under water in Fallen Leaf Lake and in Lake Tahoe off Baldwin Beach prove that forests once thrived in these locations when the water level in each lake was much lower. Shallows now covered by water were once covered by trees, indicating climates much drier than modern times. By studying the stumps of those drowned trees, scientists can reconstruct the climate history of the region. What do you think Lake Tahoe might look like in the future as a result of climate change? Cutting through a terminal moraine left by glaciers, Taylor Creek flows out of Fallen Leaf Lake. Non-native kokanee salmon spawn there in the fall. With the help of human management, the kokanee have become a part of Tahoe's post-glacial scene.
Moving north, we see Cascade Lake and Emerald Bay, and a ridge separating the two. When you're driving along the highway atop that ridge, you are riding the backbone of the lateral moraine left behind by glaciers 13,000 years ago. Terminal moraines were deposited at the end of the glacier's path. Can you see the underwater terminal moraine at the mouth of Emerald Bay? The tallest cliff along the West Tahoe Fault is located at D.L. Bliss State Park. When hiking along the Rubicon Trail from Emerald Bay to D.L. Bliss, you are walking along the West Tahoe Fault. The glaciers of the southwest shore spilled down the canyons from a large thick ice field that covered the Sierra Crest. Over the centuries, the glaciers surged and retreated like busy bulldozers piling up moraines. Sometimes glaciers blocked outflow from the lake, raising the water much higher than the current level. When the water behind the ice dam rose high enough, it floated the ice and the dam collapsed, releasing huge floods downstream. We've learned enough about glaciers now to recognize their footprints. Can you find the lateral moraines flanking each U-shaped valley? The melt-off from the ice field carried sediment down the underwater cliff of the West Tahoe Fault, forming an alluvial fan. Do you see a cut across the alluvial fan? This is evidence of fault movement after the fan was deposited. The fault offset exceeds the height of a three-story building. Near Tahoe City, the landscape changes from granitic mountains scraped by glacial ice to volcanic mountains formed with fire. A large portion of the underwater shelf south of Tahoe City is missing. What happened here? All evidence indicates that an underwater landslide triggered by an earthquake occurred here about 50,000 years ago. The huge chunks in the middle of the lake stick up from the otherwise level sediment. They're made of the same material as the shelf. The longest of these blocks is almost a mile long and another block is nearly 500 feet tall. If the dimensions of the largest blocks are compared to the dimensions of the Golden Gate Bridge, you can see that these slabs are truly gigantic. Imagine the energy released when these huge slabs of sediment hundreds of feet thick slid several miles underwater across the lake bottom. The landslide raised a large destructive wave called a tsunami. Huge waves crashed over the shores all around the lake. Seismologists have developed a computer model that recreates what the actual event might have looked like. In this view, the simulation is superimposed on the satellite image of the basin today. The initial tsunami wave and its many reverberations called Seiche waves spread the energy from the landslide around the lake. Within 20 minutes, nearly everything living close to the lake was destroyed. Could such a catastrophe happen again? In the centuries to come, earthquakes and smaller underwater landslides could still cause destructive tsunamis. We've seen evidence of extreme events, earthquakes that formed steep cliffs, a volcanic mountain range that closed off the valley, glaciation that gouged canyons and dammed the outlet, droughts that lasted for over a thousand years, and an underwater landslide that caused a huge destructive tsunami. The shape of the land is a record of all these events. What are we to learn from Lake Tahoe's geologic past and future? Here are some ideas to consider. If the lake can recover from the Comstock logging and the devastating tsunami, it can surely recover from the effects of modern human development. Will the clarity of the lake recover within our lifetimes because we make the effort needed, or after we're long gone because we could not live in harmony with nature? The decision is ours. We see deeper into the scenery when we examine it with the eyes of science. Our appreciation of Lake Tahoe is enhanced by our greater understanding of its natural processes over the vast span of time. <laughs>